Of all the world-changing inventions of the 19th century, none has made such a difference to how we view the world as moving pictures. But Louis Le Prince, the man who would capture the world's first moving pictures, would mysteriously vanish, have his invention overshadowed and perhaps even stolen, and wallow in obscurity before being given, in recent years, the attention and credit which he's always deserved. This is a tragic story of the father of film. Now, when we talk about the history of inventions, we tend to focus on a handful of great individuals whilst ignoring all those who contributed to their work. Science isn't a sprint to the finish line, it's a relay race where the torch is passed from one person to another and everyone who has discovered or invented something has done so while standing on the shoulders of giants. As such, this video isn't just about Louis Le Prince, it's about all the other pioneers who each played their part in the invention of film. Louis Le Prince was born in Metz in France in 1841. As a child, he spent time in the studio of photography pioneer Louis Daguerre, whose early photographs, known as daguerreotypes, include the earliest known photo of a person in 1838, which required an exposure time of five minutes to capture. As an adult, he studied at Leipzig University, where he met Leeds-born engineer John Whitley. They became friends, and in 1866, Whitley invited him to stay in Leeds. Three years later, he married John's sister Elizabeth, and in 1872, their son, Adolf, was born. People had known for some time that you could create the illusion of motion by moving lots of images very fast, and there were plenty of toys and parlour tricks which could demonstrate this. The real problem came when you tried to capture motion in the real world. In 1878, Edward Maybridge used 12 different cameras in a line to capture images of a galloping horse. These could then be played together to create the illusion of motion. Similarly, in 1882, Etienne Jules Murray invented a photographic gun which could take 12 images per second. Using this, he discovered that cats always land on their feet. But these weren't proper motion picture cameras as we know them today. It would take someone else to put all these ideas together and improve on them. To learn more about Louis Le Prince, I'm going to the National Science and Media Museum in Bradford, the UNESCO City of Film. So I'm joined by Hi, I'm Tony. Um, I'm the curator of film at the National Science and Media Museum. We're in the centre of Bradford and we're open every day and we look at the history of all of our popular media um, and this is one of our star objects. So the museum has not one but two of the Prince's cameras. So with so many of the early prototypes going missing throughout history, how did the museum come to acquire the two? Uh, so the two cameras came to us directly from the Le Prince family. Um, in 1930, a plaque was opened in Leeds celebrating his work, and his daughter Marie came over from New York to be part of that ceremony. Um, and with her, she brought these two cameras. Uh, at that time, she presented them to the Science Museum in London. We're part of the same organisation. Our focus, one of our focuses, is film, and so they ended up with us here in Bradford. Brilliant. So tell me a bit about the first camera that Louis made. So the first one is a little bit peculiar. It's a 16 lens camera because it's got 16 lenses in it. Um, he made that in Paris in 86-87 and managed to film a very short sequence with it. It's one of those cameras that we don't often refer to as the first cine camera because of its construction. Because it's using 16 lenses, it's actually taking 16 separate photographs, one through each lens, which are then put back together again for um, potential projection. So it's, it's slightly different. It's more like sequential photography than it is actual uh, cinematography or filmmaking. So we probably realised the limitations of this 16 lens camera quite quickly. So what did he do next? 
Yeah, he probably did. Um, it's, it's like any new technology. It's a prototype, it's an experiment, seeing if it works. And there are lots of drawbacks with the 16 lens camera. Um, not least because you're taking 16 images from slightly different positions. So if you try and put them together as a piece of moving footage, they don't quite line up. So moving on from that, it became evident that you need to use a single lens, which is when you get onto his next camera, which is exactly what he did. Um, the camera itself has got two lenses at the front, but one of them is the viewfinder, so where the actual operator would look through, and the, one, uh, the other one is the taking lens. So every image is taken through a single lens, so you don't have that problem of parallax, of things looking different from different viewpoints. Brilliant. I mean, it's really remarkable to actually have the world's first motion picture camera right here. It, is there anything more we should know about it? Um, it's an unusual looking camera. I think you, you can see when you look at it. Um, it. It works in exactly the same way as cine cameras came to work um, after the process time. There are some slightly different bits with it. So if you look at a, a traditional cine camera, it's a single strip of film moving in front of a single lens, which is held in position momentarily while the shutter opens to let the light in, captures an image, the film moves on when the shutter closes. So all of that has to be um, brought together to move and work together absolutely perfectly, which this one did. There are certain elements which it doesn't have, so if you look at a traditional piece of film, it has pocket holes down the side, lots of little holes, which then connect with a mechanism inside the camera to hold it in position. The prompts didn't think of sprocket holes, so when you see the films themselves, you can see the film has moved a little bit, so the register isn't great. But, you know, he, he was there and he knew what he was doing and he knew the basic principles of, of how to make this thing work. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. It, it's really great to hear someone who clearly knows so much about how cameras work, so thank you. You're very welcome. Um, it's great to be able to talk about the Prance and get, let, let people get to know a little bit more about him. Um, he wasn't terrifically successful and he's been a, lost a little bit to history, but I think if we can remember what he was trying to achieve, and to a degree achieved, several years before cinema arrived, in, uh, in everybody's lives, um, he's, a, he's an important figure. On the 14th of October 1888, at his home near Roundy Park, he captures the world's first moving pictures of his family enjoying an ordinary autumn day. In another film, he captures his young son playing the accordion. His workshop was at 160 Woodhouse Lane in Leeds, which is somewhere right here. It's incredible to think that over a hundred years ago, he was developing his cameras right here. I used to walk to my sixth form college up this road every day for two years, and I had no idea that this was here. Louis was far more focused on the camera's social as opposed to commercial potential. He believed that it was a tool which could educate, connect and liberate the people of the world. After securing a patent for his camera in 1888, he wanted to present it in New York in what would probably have been the world's first public premiere of a moving picture. In September 1890, he decided to visit his brother in Dijon before leaving for America. After boarding a train to Paris, he was never seen again. Both the British and French police, as well as his family, undertook extensive searches, but no trace of him was ever found. He was declared legally dead on the 16th of September, 1897. Naturally, wild theories have emerged as to what happened. Now, there's a lot of videos made about his disappearance, and I feel that by focusing too much on the morbid details of his demise, we shift the focus away from his achievements. But I also know that the viewer wants to know what happened to him, so that's what I'll give you. Probably the most famous theory is that he was assassinated on the orders of Thomas Edison, who wanted to take credit for the invention himself. Just a few weeks after Louis's disappearance, Edison filed what was essentially a placeholder patent for a camera very similar to Le Prince's known as a kinetoscope. 
The US Patent Office in 1883 ruled that Edison's patent for the electric light bulb was invalid because it was based on work by William E. Sawyer. And despite the English inventor Joseph Swan creating and patenting his electric light bulb entirely independently of Edison, and both men receiving patents for theirs the same year, Edison sued Swan for copyright infringement. Edison also patented an improvement to Alexander Graham Bell's telephone, but the improvement had already been independently invented by David Edward Hughes, who chose not to patent it because he believed that it was for public good. But because Edison got the patent, he got all the credit. One really sad example of this is that in 1888, William Freeze Green created some type of motion camera, we don't know what, and actually sent the details of it to Edison, like a chicken wandering into the path of a hungry fox. And unsurprisingly, William died penniless in 1921, never receiving the credit or revenue for something which he undoubtedly helped create. The point is, Edison was not afraid to take credit for work he didn't do, and it's something of a coincidence that he assigned his assistant, William Kennedy Dixon, to start work on the kinetoscope just a month after Louis disappeared. When Dixon later started his own company, American Mutoscope, it was sued by Edison in 1898, and Louis' son Adolf was brought in by the defence as a witness to testify that Le Prince had actually invented the first motion camera, in the hope that this would render Edison's patent null and void. Coincidentally or not, three years later, Adolf died in a duck hunting accident in New York. In addition, in 1891, just a few months after Louis' disappearance, his widow was on a boat from New York to Manhattan when she saw Edison talking to an attorney who had once advised Louis on patents. All of this is circumstantial, and there's no real serious evidence of Edison's role in Louis' disappearance, so regardless of what might have happened, the fact remains that, in 1893, with the first public premiere of the kinetoscope, Edison's legacy was sealed. He was crowned as the inventor of the motion picture, whilst Le Prince languished in obscurity. But one final thing. In 1876, Wordsworth Donisthorpe from Leeds applied for a patent for a motion picture camera. An early model of this was built, but as nothing is known of its experiments and the fact that he wouldn't return to the idea until after Le Prince had succeeded with his camera, it's reasonable to assume that this prototype didn't work. The 19th century was a time of tremendous invention, with so many brilliant minds struggling with the biggest technological problems of the day, eager to break through and be the first to claim invention of something that would change the world. It's remarkable that there were two people in the same place at the same time, working neck and neck on the same idea. Science is all about cooperation, of working together for the common good and every runner in the scientific relay race is just as vital as the one who crosses the finish line.